It is my privilege at this hour to introduce our speaker uh, on to us, Brother Matthew, or Brother Matt, as I call him, Brother Matt Shelton. Brother Matt is a graduate of the Memphis School of Preaching, having graduated in 2004. He and his good wife, uh, Susan, are working with the church down in Thompson, Georgia, uh, with the Thompson Church of Christ. And how long have you been there, Brother Matt? 13 years. 13 years. He's got some stick to itiveness, if you can uh, learn that word. That's a good word to learn, isn't it? Stick to itiveness. I always appreciated Brother Matt. Brother Matt was one who, who has ability and he's used his ability. Brother Matt also is a man who always demonstrated uh, a wonderful attitude, always had a good demeanor about him while he was in school. Uh, he's applied himself to the work of the Lord. He's uh, dedicated himself to the cause of Christ. He's got a good help meet with him. I don't know if she's here to keep him straight this week or not. I think maybe she's been around. and she, I don't know if she's in here right now or not. But Brother Matthew, oh, okay. There she is. Right there. Okay, I didn't see her. Well, I thought she might be uh, with her uh, parents. Her parents are here. So what I was going to say, Susan, is, is that if you were not here, his mother-in-law and father-in-law are here, and uh, she'll keep him straight. <laughs> she keeps all the students around here straight because she's our executive secretary, uh, Sister Sherry Brown, and she's here uh, today. What were those in-law jokes you were telling me about? <laughs> oh. But I'll, I'll leave that up to him. It kind of slips in my mind exactly. What he said about something about outlaws or something. I don't know. No, he's going to be speaking to us on the topic of in danger of eternal damnation. And so, Brother Matt, come speak to us, brother. Thank you, Brother Bland, for that kind introduction. Uh, it is a joy to look out and to see so many familiar faces, so many faces that. For most of lectureships, this is one of a few times of year that we can see one another, and it echoes towards the reunion of a greater day of recognition, of reuniting with loved ones who have gone on before, and, and it's with that thought in mind that I immensely enjoy the theme of this lectureship, of building your hopes on things eternal. And it's for that reason, and of course, because I was called and was asked, and I said yes. And then I was given the topic. And there's a, I guess my first instinct was to think, well, maybe this is a Brother Mosier joke that I'm not quite getting. <laughs> We're going to take the topic, and is it ironic? Can we build hope? Can we have hope through a study of the danger of eternal damnation? And it is, I'm thankful for the topic because it has challenged my view. I spent some time in course in Thompson preaching some periphery material and I was confronted by a sister to say I was the third gospel preacher in her decades of being a member of the church that she had ever heard preach a sermon on the topic of, of, of hell, of eternal damnation. And I can understand I think part of the sentiment of it. It becomes an urgent before the important style scenario. Because any time that we would have, and if I was to quote Brother Bland from my notes, it would be one of the roles of a prophet is to afflict the comforted and comfort the afflicted. And, and in any given Sunday, as a preacher, you're thinking to yourself, what's the message that, that the congregation needs? And more often than not, I, dare I say, maybe most every Sunday, I'm going in and, you know, there's somebody that needs comforting. There's somebody that's in pain. There's somebody that, that needs encouragement. And to take, well, but that's the Sunday I'm going to preach on characteristics of hell. Or, well, wow. Kind of feels like you're kicking somebody when they're down. And, and I'm grateful for the topic in that it has challenged my view of what it means to preach on hell. And that it is actually constructive in the preaching of it. There's also a consequence when we don't preach on it. Uh, before we get too far into the application of the hour, uh, I'd like us to spend some time in examination simply of the terminology involved. Because, unfortunately, 
there's been a lot of false doctrine, and brethren can and have and will uh, fill entire lectureships just on the false teachings that take place that would try to justify a different in life scenario or a different day of judgment that with, other than that what is just described in the scriptures. And so when we talk about the first term of our phrase, danger, from the Greek enokos, we usually think in danger in English terms as, well, this is a risk. If it's dangerous, then it's risky. Not necessarily the meaning of enokos. Really, it means to be subject to, to be liable towards. This is a term that means that one is subject to a court. So you think in terms of uh, the IRS is a danger to me because I'm underneath the IRS, right? <laughs> Amen, exactly. And because I'm underneath the IRS, as are all of us, there's certain things that I do, like if you, you've been having brethren, you know, dinners out with the brethren, and you take a picture with your cell phone to have the receipt so you can tag that as, yes, this was done with the brethren, and, and that's, that's another maybe 50 cents that, that uh, I, I can maybe afford to pay this year. And, whew. But, you know, if there wasn't that level of accountability, I don't think I'd take a photo of a receipt ever again. There's something about that accountability that forces a more stalwart watch on my part. To be in danger of something is to be underneath its authority. And of course, is this an important term? Yes. Is it a complex term? Not necessarily. Unfortunately, there are plenty of doctrines that would say, and. You know, that, uh, well, there's only a portion of the population that is simply just not subject to a day of judgment. We call them the elect, and, and whoa, we're, we're, taking, we're taking a description, a term that God has used, a day that he has set aside, that is a court to rule over all of mankind, and then we're going to call some of us exempt from it kind of removes some of the power of the scripture's teaching there, doesn't it? Second term, as we would look, is one of eternal. Now, where the term enokos is used a handful of times in the scriptures, um, ionios is used pretty frequently, uh, some 72 times, most of the time interchanging between eternal and everlasting, with uh, a few smidgens of other references besides. But this is a, not a complex term. But again, mankind's made it complex. I'd once heard a description of what is controversial in the church. And uh, it was by Brother Cates. He was a couple minutes late for class. I think he was too, too much of a gentleman to say, but I'm pretty sure he'd been on the phone with somebody that was uh, trying to get under his skin. But he comes in, he says, you know what makes controversy in the church is when mankind wants to do something that God has said we're not supposed to be doing. <laughs> it's a clash of wills. And are there <laughs> false doctrines that would undermine an eternal nature to the afterlife? That we could be baptized for our ancestors or to pay a, a sum of indulgence or just that, well, if I'm on the wrong side of the afterlife, then I just cease existing and well, unfortunately, yes. The term isn't complex, but we've made it complex. Likewise, when we, when we don't preach on the subject of, of the eternal damnation, and this term for damnation is uh, krisis, uh, from the word krino, can mean to condemn, can mean railing accusation. So as we look to the danger of eternal damnation, if we look to that and said, well, what if we were talking about IRS? To be in danger is to be subject to, and then to have an accusation if the IRS tells me I'm in trouble. Now we're getting into the condemnation of the court, not just the office of the court not just the power of the court. And so to be subject to any, a, a danger of eternal damnation is, again, in and of itself, not a complex term. But we make it complex when, as, as a species, we undermine what it is that's given to us. And is it inconsequential? 
that we see so many of these false doctrines that would float about. Sometimes I think there is the impression given that, well, we need to be, we need to not be negative. And if we're preaching on a subject of hell or, or preaching on a subject of, of the topic under consideration, then we must be inherently negative. And well, but consider how many times did Jesus reference an eternal condemnation or judgment? In Matthew 5, 22, he references that if we're unjust in accusation of a brother, then it's going to be, it's not going to be a good time to be had. It's extremely dangerous. We are subject to where we are guilty before the court of God. And there's this incentivation that's given. Jesus doesn't just say, well, don't be don't be unjust to a brother. Don't make an accusation without cause. Because if you do, then you'll get slightly less of a place in heaven than if you didn't. No. The consequence is much more severe than that. And unfortunately, it is perhaps uh, an element of mankind where we, we incentivize. We incentivize everything. It is the modern turning of economics. And... And if we were to say to ourselves, well, but it's ruling by fear, and, and fear isn't necessarily a bad thing. If you have a teenager who has a curfew, does that curfew have consequences if it's broken? Are the consequences severe enough to make the child think twice before they break it? Because if the consequence is, oh, well, I'm only getting 90% of my allowance this week for breaking curfew, they're going to break curfew. God has seen to it that we have, we have a, an, an impetus, a motive, a catalyst. Why do we look at, and as we look to this example here of Matthew 5, 29, again from the Sermon on the Mount, the importance of having both eyes in the ancient world really can barely be understated. If there's anything that would be more important than having both eyes as far as being able to, to maintain a, a trade as a craftsman or to be able to hunt and shoot uh, would be maybe to keep a right hand. In Matthew 5, 29, Jesus lays out that better would it be to lose some of the most important body parts that you would have in the ancient world than, than to lose the whole body and be cast into hell. Now, why does he say this, this comparison contrast? Why does he lay out that it would be better to exercise this, this insane level of discipline, seemingly insane level of discipline, well, what's he talking about? What's the verse before Matthew 5, 29? He's talking about sexual discipline. Do we have a society that is sexually undisciplined? Yeah. Have we done the right thing in not preaching? on the consequences of not holding to the way of righteousness. Consider with me again, same topic really, Hebrews 13, 4. The marriage bed, it's honorable. What is the motivation for keeping the marriage bed honorable? Because if I don't, I'm on the wrong side of judgment. It becomes nothing less than a, than a spiritual life and death matter. That's how important marriage and the honor of marriage is. And so when we don't teach on a topic, inquiring minds still want to know. And they fill in the gaps on their own. I think that's part of why we have the proliferation of so many false systems concerning a day of judgment. Unfortunately, we're seeing resurgences of, uh, of false doctrines about 
a day of judgment or whether or not Jesus came back in AD 70 and, and things that I had thought were doctrines we weren't entertaining anymore, that we had that we had dealt with to some degree or another. And yet, when, when we are not diligent in maintaining the truth, then the gaps will be filled by other things. You know, as the author of wisdom would encapsulate the fear of God and keep his commandments, we're familiar with the first reference at the end of this verse. Why do we do that? It's, it's the whole duty of man, the whole of man. What's the second reason that's given for why we should fear God and keep his commandments? Because there's a judgment day. Why would there be two reasons there? We have this postmodern judgment that would tell us if we're doing something negative, then that's inherently bad. And, and yet, we see here the carrot and the stick, don't we? It's important enough a goal to be righteous, to be on the right side of God's judgment, that we can't afford to just ignore some of the tools that are available to us. Of course, a familiar text to any of us that have gone through the school. But this and later imperatives that are given in this chapter as far as to what is expected uh, by Paul towards Timothy and what's the reason that's given? And again, because there's going to be a judgment day coming. And of that judgment, <laughs> that, that because that judgment day is approaching, we have a responsibility to be ready for it. And it's because that judgment day is coming that we would preach the truth, that we would watch in all things and endure afflictions and do all of the counsel of God and teaching. Because it's a sobering day that's coming. And in Matthew 5.20, we see uh, the relationship given to us that that it is, again, a spiritual life and death matter. Why do we reach out to the brethren around us? Why do we, why do we say, well, someone's having a problem with sin? You know, well, as long as I don't have to deal with it, let them, let them go on and I'll be at peace. And no. We need to be reaching out. <laughs> and the reason we reach out is because, it's because we're saving a soul from death. Is it a matter of, of the spiritual utmost that we look to the things of eternity? And when we look towards, towards, a, towards the danger of eternal judgment, this isn't fear-mongering just for the sake of having fear. No, I think the Lord has given us a tool it's not the only tool that we use, but it is a tool to help address our own minds. Sometimes fear is what we need. Fear can be useful. I uh, didn't get in as much trouble as some of my brothers, uh, and some of my brothers didn't get as much trouble on me on things because I saw the punishment that my little brother got or my older brother got for something, and I became afraid. <laughs> and I didn't want that punishment. And in knowing that, I was able to avoid a little bit of trouble. One of the, the words of wisdom of my dad was to always use the right tool for the job. He's retired now from being a machinist for, uh, for some 40 odd years. And uh, machinist slash mad scientist, plenty of stories, stories to tell about that. <laughs> but you know, when we don't use the tool of, of the danger of judgment to address the needs of our soul, the, the catalyst of staying righteous, of doing the things that we ought to be doing, then we're trying to cut down a tree with a sledgehammer. It's the wrong tool for the job. Grab an ax. But what happens when you try to cut down a tree with a sledgehammer? 
you get frustrated. <laughs> and when we don't take the right tool for the job and we don't preach the whole counsel of God as it relate to even the condemnation that threatens all of mankind, is it any wonder that we don't find ourselves as effective as we wish we could be? Maybe we don't find ourselves as driven as we want to be. We've ignored a tool. And in the doing so, we pay a consequence for that. But it's not just the use of and the preaching of the danger of eternal damnation as a tool of utter fear, and, and that's all it is. Uh, I would propose to you that there's something to be said in the developing of of gratitude that is more accurately informed. Consider the parable of the two servants. Of this, we have the one who owes a huge amount of money, the other owes next to nothing. The master forgives them both. And with this, there's a difference that's given. Presupposed in this parable is that both men are well aware of the debt that's been paid. What if neither one knew how much was owed? What if they owed the same amount? The message of the parable doesn't really equate, does it? When we don't teach what it is that we're being saved from, do we gain more of an appreciation for it or less? And this way, I think, Preaching on, on the danger of, of a sinner's hell can be an instrument for us to have gratitude on. You ever almost had a car accident? What's your first reaction? Whew. Glad that didn't happen to me. There's hope in that expression of that was a danger, that was a catastrophe that I didn't just go through right there. That's nice. <laughs> That's a good feeling. How much better when we can know that and how much safer can we feel when we know that we're on the right side of God's message of grace. And so our gratitude is improved. Notice also in Colossians 1, 12 uh, through 14, earlier in the text, mentioning the vocation, the walk that we would have as Christians. And, and within this walk, we give thanks. What is it we're giving thanks for? Part of what we're giving thanks for is, well, numerous in, in, its, in its consequences here. But among that, actually listed first among that, is being delivered from the power of darkness. You know, the, uh, the term for joy, charis, is, uh, is a term that the Greeks and Romans used in reaction to a gift. And there's a principle about this term joy that was, you've given me a gift, I feel joy. And that the better the gift, the more joy I feel. This isn't a complex thing. If I gave you a $5 bill, you'd say, thanks, it's nice, it's a $5 bill, sure. What if, uh, what if I wrote off your house note? Are you gonna have a different reaction? Not, not that I can, but you know. <laughs> when we receive a greater gift, we have a greater emotional reaction of joy when we are aware of what the justice of God looks like we are that much more aware of what the mercy of our Lord looks like and I am convinced that when we are that much more aware of God's mercy we will be that much more eager to share that mercy with everyone around us to as one preacher put it go to heaven and take as many people with us as we can brother Mosier is not a fan of being quoted from his notes 
But he has been noted to say that if you want to be popular in the brotherhood, you need to not speak very long. The hour is uh, close to being upon us. We've got some time for the dinner break. And the message itself is not a complex one. Uh, there's, but that said, there is a challenge to us in that it's not a negative thing to preach on hell. You know, if there's a warning that's coming towards my way, I want to know about it. If there's a tornado that's in my area, I want my phone to alert me. <laughs> Even if it's not good news, it's good if I react on that bad news, isn't it? We can have a stronger hope for heaven by being more educated and educating those in turn around us on the dangers that await if we are on the wrong side of God's judgment. Brother, and I thank you so much for your time and attention.